So my name is Ramoslav Stankov. You can find me on the internet with us Air Stankov pretty much everywhere. Where is legal to find me there? I work for a small American startup called Product Hunt. And today I'm going to talk about React and Redux. So just some cautionary tales. I like to have a lot of code in my slides and use because I like to code. And all the code I'm going to show you is already online. It's in this address, Rest of Tops code. And you can find all my presentation codes there. Uh, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt me every time you have questions. Just raise your hands. Doesn't matter right or left hand, just one of the hands, maybe two of them. And a mic will come to you and you will ask the questions and hopefully I will hear it. So when I like to start uh, talking about presentations and like d discussing big ideas, I like to go back to like history. I mean, uh, a lot of times we get a new technology and we say, okay, that's the best new cool thing and we forget how was the world before it. So uh, um, in my explanation to Redux, I'm actually going to pass by React, Flux, and why <coughs> Redux is the currently the best stuff. I'll be using the painlessly known example of the to-do application, where you enter to-dos, you have tasks, you can filter them, like, here it is, if I find my Chrome. So here is the application, let's do, oops, my cursor was here, so now it's here. So yeah, it's pretty much the basic to do application. You can add tasks, you can complete it, you can filter tasks. There is a clear completed task button if I can hit it. And you can remove tasks. I mean, it's not a rocket science, but it's a very nice explanation. So let's start first by building this in the plain React. We say, okay, there is no libraries. We're just going to use React with no dependencies. Just React as it meant to. So this is our application, so what does it have? It has a field to enter stuff, it has a list of tasks, tasks that have two states, there is this counter, which is currently wrong because there is one task and actually it hits four here, so I have to take my screenshots, and we have the filterings and the clear to do. And I will show you the most ugly slide now. So one of the goals when React first started was, okay, you can actually write your whole application into a single file, and let's do that. It's a very simple file. You have filters, which are just plain old HTML5 current functions, and you have filters by all, which just returns true. We have active filter, completed filter. By default, you start with filter alls and an empty to-do list. Then you have a render function where this is pretty much your whole application. Please notice this is intentionally blocked out because there are some typos here. And it's pretty simple. We have a div which contains our app. We have an arrow which is some design element with some creative design I've thought of. We have a custom input field where when it's saved, it handles a new to do action. We have a list where we get all the filters to do and we convert them to React elements, lists, we use this React key thing, we have a class name, which is completed or not, we have a checkbox, which is the checks with the hicks or the other thing, we have a button for destroying, we have a footer where we have the counter text, where we have filters, which like are those filters, we just group to them to show them, we have a clear button which is only visible where this function is executed and here are some more code like the counter text is there some calculations here not very important for this presentation but I just want to show some ground code here uh, there is like filter to do's where we get all our to do's we filter them by the filter function so that's a little bit more advanced but the idea here is we have all our to do's and we only display the ones which are filtered like with our filters. Now it's the crazy move. My head already starts to spin here. I'm wondering. We have a function which adds a new to-do, which just creates a new to-do, adds to our state, updates the whole application. 
We have the clear complete, which just remaps all the application. We have the to do, the, the other, and that already starts to spin. Like, we already are wondering, okay, this is a big file, this is a mess, I have no idea what's going on. I mean, I know because I write it, but like, I don't know for you guys. So we can actually try to split it, split it into slices. I mean, like everybody, when we start coding, we start with a big file or always, and then we start splitting into a small pieces. So this is our application. This is the application, and this is the perfect React code we want to have. And we do it logically. The app, this is the whole container. This is the whole content we have. Then is the to-do. We have a new to-do component where is the form with the nasty arrow, with the input and some behavior. Then we have a to-do list. This is the list of our current to-dos. It shows the, the to-dos based on a filter and the to-do have a lot of to-do items in it, which are those small things. Then we have a footer and this footer is like our junk drawer. Is the place we put all the functionality where there isn't a good UI for it. So here we put the counter, we put the clear button, and we have a custom component for filters because they're a special snowflake. And, and I suspect <coughs> that in future design reversions, we can actually move those active buttons on the top of the list, not on the bottom, or put them sideways. So that's basically our application. Like, it's if we want to make it, and this will be a good architecture, but okay, we have this app, it's nice, but where is the data limit? Like, where is all the data of the application? Where is our content? Because this is currently only Chrome, this is only UI. So our application state, we have two things which are our application state. One is the list of to-dos, the list of tasks we are going to make, and the other is the filter name, the thing which we are displaying, which is all cleared or done. All right. So fast forward a little bit. We have this app and we convert our app. There is the bit more code here. And this is our code here. Uh, we have this, our new to-do. We have a to-do list. We have a footer. None of those components have access to our data. Our data lives here. It's somewhere here. And the only way w we can uh, use this data so our subcomponents know about it is passing it and passing it directly as properties. So for the new to-do, the only thing it needs is a function which when it's called, it creates a new to-do. Nothing more. Our to-do list needs a to-do list. It needs all the to-dos filtered by our current filter. This is the, the, the to-dos which will be displayed. Then it needs two other functions which doesn't make much sense to be there, but we need them. The toggle to-do and remove to-do. Toggle to-do is this thing and remove to-do is a hex which should be somewhere here. But it's needed by its subcomponent, so we have to pass it. Uh, footer is even more messier. Filter, uh, the footer needs the, the list of all our to-dos so it can display its counter. So it say you have five to-do lefts, 10 to-do lefts, no to-do lefts. You need all the, the list of all the filters because it needs it to display the list of the filters so you can filter. It needs the currently active filter, which is the one which is highlighted. Like in the UI here, you see, I mean, I don't know if you see, there is like a red square here which marks the currently active one. So we actually have to pass it. We need to change filter. So when this function is called by the footer in some way, our currently active <coughs> filter changes. And we need a function which loops through all our to-dos and removes them. And okay, that's nice. It's pretty nice. We are, our code is a little bit cleaner. We have some separation of concerns. We also have some domain logic here, some methods. Let's go to the to-do list. Like the to-do list, we, we get some props validation, which is very useful in React components. If the component doesn't get those properties, it will blow up, which is a very useful documentation method. I mean, nobody looks at documentation until something blows up. So that's a pretty nice way to like group stuff. So this thing, it needs, it needs two functions and a to-do list. And why do you need these those two functions? It just needs them to pass them to the to-do item. It gets a to-do list here. 
It looks through all the to-dos, creates a to-do item component, it gives it the to-do item so it can display it, and the two functions which are toggle to-do and remove to-do. And we are happy. I mean, everything is nice, world is <laughs> funny, we are all like pretty happy about it, and then somebody comes and says, okay, let's add a new action. Let's, I mean, currently we can remove to-dos, we can complete to-dos, but we can't edit to-dos. We cannot change their text, and I'm the person who makes a lot of typos. So I really need stuff to be ed editable in some other way. So, okay, what is involved of adding a new action? I, I guess it's easy, like, let's see. So this is our application. We have the app component, we have the new to-do, we have the to-do list, which is the whole array here, and we have to-do items, we have a footer, we have a filters, and we, for updating to-do, <laughs> what do we need? We need to create a new function, which is called update to-do, very surprisingly. And uh, I'm seeing that here I have a typo, here should be a toggle to-do. I just made a typo, and that's the reason I need editing in the first place. So we have the update to do, and we have to pass it to the to-do list. Then the to-do list have to add it as a validation. Then the to-do list have to pass it to the to-do item. And it's nice, but actually it isn't. Why our to-do list knows about uh, what the to-do item can do? I mean, imagine if we had like an uh, enterprise app when we have 20 levels of components, why from the root component we have to pass like 20 functions <laughs> like in a bucket just throw them down and every other component has to know it. If I want to reorder my app, then I have to get those functions from somewhere else. And for a simple change, adding an update button, I have to, in the perfect scenario, I have to do two things. Write the function or somebody else do it or and expose this in the UI. And that's the only place I have to change. So that's the reason, I mean, when Facebook released React, uh, it came to uh, a little bit later, they introduced Flux. Flux was a way to add, to add uh, architecture on top of React so we can have an easier way to manage our state and to have a, 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 very, a better separation of concerns that our to-do list shouldn't know what kinds of actions our to-do items need to do. So Flux has four words. It has the word action, it has the word dispatcher, it has the word store, and it has a word view. So let's start with the store. Store, I mean, if the, is the date, I mean, it's a store. I mean, it's not very imaginative naming. The store is the, the, our application state. It's, in, uh, in our case, the store is our data. The store is the important stuff, it's the information. The store, the view, is our React layer. The view is the React code. The view takes data from the store. When the view wants to update the data, it shouldn't touch the store directly because if, if it does it, we actually, the, the other components who are using the same store wouldn't know about it. So the view, send something called an action. It says, for example, I'm making a new action, remove this to do. The action is get, and it's processed by something which is called a dispatcher. It's just an, just an event handler, where you send all the events, and the dispatcher sends all those actions to the store. The store, based on the actions, changes itself. The only one who can change the store is, is the store itself, and then, the store updates the view state. And we, in this way, we get a single flow of action and view. And in this way, if, you, if we have a to-do item and I check it here, and I have the to-do item in the other place on my UI, uh, those two places will be updated in the same time because they will be using the same store. And the store doesn't care from which view the change comes. Also, one extension, which I, I'm not going to talk about today, is if we have like an external API where we get the data, it also generates actions which go to the dispatcher and updates the view. Pretty much we only have one part of layers. So, okay, store. How the store looks like. So, uh, the React Flux uh, APM package have a class which is called 
uh, reduce store. It has several types of store, but I like the reduce store a lot. And it's a simple class which we create our own to do store class. It extends the uh, reducer store for React. And it has to override two methods. The first method is initial state. What's our state in our store without any data? What's of the empty state? Like, what's the beginning? In our case, it's an empty array. The whole state of our application is empty array. The other function is called reduce. It comes from the MapReduce uh, functional programming methodology. The idea of the reduce is I get the state, I get an action, and I return you a brand new state without mutating your existing state. In this way, I can have a box of changes without interfering into each other. The idea here is quite simple. This function is called every time a dispatcher receives an event. In our case, we have four actions. We have the to do add action, which just adds a new to do to our state, which is an array. We have a to do toggle, which just loops through all the tasks and if their ID matches the action ID, it completes the task somewhere, I think, here. We have to do remove, uh, where we filter all the tasks and remove the one which are our current tasks. And we have to do clear, which loops through all the stuff and removes all the not completed tasks, all, all completed tasks. So uh, the idea here is those, does th this function every time returns a new state, if there is a change. I mean, if there's no state, it just returns the current one. And we don't get into race condition situations because all of this data is immutable. Like, we just, this is a pure function in the functional terminology term. The idea is it has one input and it has one output. It doesn't care anything about the rest of the world. But let's actually show how this works. So we just create a new dispatcher. We get, create a new store and it pass, it pass that dispatcher to the store. And now we have a store. When we call it get state, it returns an empty array. How we are adding a to do to our store? We are dispatching an action. We are dispatching a to do at action with the text and task name. Then when we get the state, we have our task. Then when we call toggle action with some ID, uh, we see that the completed is from false, it's translated to true. We have a new state. And if you want to remove a task, we just dispatch a remove action and we return that ID. And we get the state and it's an empty array. The other state we have in our application is the filters, which are the active filters, which are the active state. Our filters are, we have the name, all, and we have a filter function, which is the key from the name. It's, I'm grouping it together because it's easier to use. The, its reduce function is a little bit more difficult. It has a check. It gets an action with the type filter select. It checks if this filter actually exists. If the filter doesn't exist, we can throw an error, or we can do what most developers do ignore it and or return the new, the new filter. And having those stores, uh, they contain all the data. They are singletons. They are a single place where our, our data lives. And they are accessible from every component in our system. So our application is coming to its nice end. This is how our application code looks with Flux. It's pretty much without save the code. I mean, it's pretty much the same as this. How our to-do list look? Oh, okay, we are running some new stuff here. So, the to-do list, what the to-do list needs? It needs a list of tasks to display, and it needs the filter to filter those items. So we come here, and this is our new to-do. It looks scary the first time you see it. Actually, it looks scary now. Let's make it a less scary. So first thing you notice that we are importing from the Flux library, we are exporting importing something which is called a container. So while working with React, they are slowly, they are emerging like two types of components. Uh, we call them container components and components, or dummy components if you want to offend somebody. So the two types of components are that the dummy component doesn't hold any state, doesn't hold any values. It just presents data and triggers some actions. And the container is the one who is responsible for fetching data, 
keeping state, uh, getting stuff from the store. And it's go and how it's done, we create a, we get this container class and we made our to do our normal React component and then instead of returning our to do list component, we wrap this component in the container create function. This will create a, 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 a container around our class and it will be used as a shield. The other thing uh, which is weird here is those two methods. So that's uh, the two methods from the flux library which the container element search, it searches its child element. First, it asks, okay, which stores I'm interested in, which data from the rich ap application domain I have is interesting. I, I'm interested in those two stores. I'm interested in to-do stores and filter stores. And this is the stores I'm interested in. And then it uses the calculate state function which said, okay, from the stores you are interested in, uh, what particular kind of state you are interested in? Because those stores can have very rich data. And in our case, I'm interested in the to-do list, the whole to-do list, and in the filter, I'm just interested in the filter function. So one nice thing which these bindings will do is every time the to-do stores changes, this calculate state is triggered again and it updates the whole UI. Every time the filter is changed, this function updates and re-renders the whole UI. And in this way, you are keeping your data and your, st and your UI in, s in perfect sync. So yeah, and here, if, if you notice the to-do item, just receive a to-do item. It doesn't get all those bloated actions it cares. Here, we just get the to-dos we care about, filtered by whatever filter is selected. We look through those to-dos and we render to-do items with that to-do. We don't get the, the actions. We just get a pretty nice to-do. We have this to-do here and it, it works nice. Then, uh, okay, let's see how the to-do item looks like. Okay, now we are having the to-do. How do I trigger actions? So the to-do item looks like this. It's uh, quite simple. We have a, it has its prop validation that it needs to do. It has its render function, which on complete triggers the toggle complete and toggle and handle remove. And those things use those functions. That's the only thing we need in our component. That's the whole component have. It uses those global functions. Plain simple. If we need to add a new update function, we just add it here. We add some Chrome UI here and, and we update our store. Two places and we are happy. So let's actually look what this remove to do looks like. So this is how the action files look like. It has a dispatch function f coming from the, our root dispatcher because we have one big dispatcher for our whole file. And the remove to do just dispatch an action where it sends the type and the ID. It's pretty much the thing we did in the example. And that's all nice, I mean it's great. Until you actually start looking at this and start thinking, uh, Okay, this dispatch is a function, but where is the real dispatcher? Where is the dispatcher object which dispatches all the data? It's here. It's in our root file. We have a global dispatcher and we have a global store. So uh, we actually have a global state. So our application right now, yes, we fixed the first issue from the React app, but now we have uh, this long uh, global state and we actually don't know what's happening <laughs> because it's a global state. I mean, uh, every app can access it. Every element can access it. We don't have any access. Uh, we don't have any restrictions there. Flux have some issues like the global state looks like a very small issue because yeah, JavaScript, we only have one app. I don't care about the global state. Until you start doing server-side rendering where you, when you have a global state, you cannot server-side render nicely. You can hack it, you can hate yourself, you can get drunk about it, but you hate it. It's not, it won't, it's not going to be good. The global state is really bad. Also, 
uh, we have problems with testing because every global state is like a very big enemy of the testing because before every test we have to clear up all the state, rebuild it again, pass clear it again and be sure that no nothing is affecting each other. Also we have the global stores but our data in those stores is isolated. How we communicate between stores, how I do some like smart stuff be for my stores there's problems with that, like Flux doesn't solve that problem because every store is its own man. It's not doing anything, it's terrible. And the, problem, and the other problem is we have something which is called dispatch locks. A lot of people, what they do is they dispatch an action and then they dispatch another action from that action. And that makes deadlocks because the dispatcher waits for everything to be dispatched before refreshing the UI and get into those language angles. I mean, you start to feel bad about it, like, not very happy about it. Like, I don't know those, who those guys are, but they don't look happy about it. So that's actually what I, I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> so that's the beginning of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about Redux. That's the most available work I've ever seen, but that's the only one I could find about Redux. And uh, let's see how, I mean, how Redux deforms Flux and makes it better, in my opinion. And the opinion of a lot more credible people than me. Uh, this is what we say is the normal Flux flow. We have the store, which have a state. The view triggers an action. The action is handled by a single dispatcher. And the dispatcher gets the store and updates the view. That's nice. Nobody sees problem with that until they do something like this. Uh, the real apps work like that. You have multiple stores which update the view. The view triggers an action. The dispatcher sends these actions to every store and every store updates the view, sometimes in multiple ways. Uh, it also causes some problems because imagine make, making an action which can update this store and this stores in the same time. What happens? Like, when is the view rendered? I mean, the app saves us by having the heartbeat rendering stuff and frame stuff, but it's a little bit undeterministic. Who stores? Who is the store who receives the action, for the action first? Who is the store who receives the action second? Does it matter? Why are you on this earth? And the other questions like that start to appear when you start thinking about it that way. So Redux does it in a, a lot more simpler way. Redux, Redux says you're only going to have a single object which is going to be your store. You have one store and you have so the things called reducers, properties of that store. And when the view sends an action, it gets by the store and there's a clear order how to reduce these actions to a state mutation, how to change your data. And when you say, okay, state mutation and stuff, I start to look fancy and I'm just going to show some code. I mean, I think code explains this better than me and gra graphics. So this is a perfect valid Redux store. It has two keys. This is our application state. To use and filter. It doesn't have anything else. That's a very nice store. Then we want to change this store. I mean, we can do it the old dirty way, just mutating properties. But that would be bad. So we just call a function which is called reduce. Like imagine we have this function reduce. We, we passed it our current state, uh, our current store. We passed it a very similar action to the one we have in Flux. And we return a totally new store. I mean, this store, it's never changed. It's just returning a new store. So when we add a new to-do action, it just returns a new store with the new to-dos. When we toggle what we to do and then we clear it, we are empty because I mean, the to-do is going to be done and then we're going to clear it. When we want to select a filter, we say store, <coughs> just select a filter with the name active and determine that filter. Plain and simple, we have a simple object. You can think about Redux in this way. You have a store which have different reducers which adapt those states which are just a simple keys on a JavaScript object. Yeah, you can make it more fancy, but in the most basic example, you just have a JavaScript object with keys, and you have a so-called reducer functions where which get actions and translate this state to, to a new state. 
and it sounds more com confusing than it actually is. So the way you do it is you have a reducer file. You just need to have a one reducer function to generate this reduce function. You just get this helper which is called combine reducers. You write your two reduce functions. You say, okay, I have, I have reducers which are to do. Reduced by this function. Visibility filter which is reduced by this function. So pretty much this key is this key, uh, is this key. And this function is this function. So in this way, you can have all the reduced stuff you need. Like this, this uh, combiner just generates this reduced function by which it gets state, action, and returns a new state. Uh, and this is how it works internally. Most of the stuff you write this once and you forget about it. So let's see how the reducer looks like. It sounds very fancy. Uh, the first time I imagined it, there will be a lot of boilerplate. So this is our to-do store. This is the flux store. It had its initial state. It had it, ah, it had the reduce function. It's, I mean, it's not like a coincidence that, they, that this function is called reduce because that's the reduce function we need for our reducers actually. Pretty much we only need a simple function which gets state it has some, it, it, it's good to have a default value, actually it's required to have a default value, and it has action types. And it's pretty much the same, I mean, we just cut some code, we don't need some classes, we don't need some initial state, we just need the simple function. This simple function is a reducer. Every action comes to here, it returns a new state, and this new state is stored in this variable. Uh, this is the visibility filter, it's pretty much the same, like, uh, it's a state, it has some state checks, it has some default state, and it's already seen. And in the combined reducers, you have the to do's, the function which generates the contents of your key to do, and the visibility filter. Okay, that's all sounding good, like kind of confusing, but nice. Uh, how are we are wiring up this in our application? So our application becomes like this. We are getting something which is called provider and something which is called create store. Okay, is this better? It's better for me, but I don't know for you guys. Okay, so, uh, how it's, this is the root of our application. This is how we do it. I mean, we have React. We always need React. We need the render, which is displaying the React stuff. We have this element which is called provider, which has to wrap our whole application. Uh, it's, uh, it's, that's the way React uh, redux, redux, uh, redux passes all its data downstairs. And we create a store from our wrap reducer function. Now we just pass the, our wrap reducer to the store and we have this provider. How this provider works? The way it works is our store now has two keys, to do's and filter, like pretty much the stuff we needed. The to do list uh, gets all the data. For, uh, but from where does it get the data? Like, Okay, now we are not passing it out. Our store is a private variable. It's not available anywhere. How our component gets to the state? And we use a very dirty trick from React, which is called context, and I should stop moving, understand. And we are using a very, like React has something which is called context. And the nice thing about context is it's a hidden data which is passed to every component you have in your render tree. And the store is available to every component in the tree as a store. It can be mutated, it can only be seen, and it's passed through those secret uh, context stuff. And the nice thing about it is you actually shouldn't think about it. Like our to-do list, now it needs data. How it, how it gets its data? It gets its data as like a props. It's a very dumb component. It's a component which gets only the properties of to do's and a filter, to do and a filter. Does its job render stuff? P this is a pure component. This component does not depend on anything external. Now, for the difficult part, we have this ugly thing here. 
It's called a decorator. <laughs> so the idea is uh, working with contexts in uh, React is kind of pain. It's not kind of pain, it's a real pain. Uh, like me moving <laughs> and making all those weird noises then. Uh, so the idea is uh, we have this uh, React Redux co connect function where we say, okay, uh, as a first argument, give me a function which gives me all the state I need from the store. How do you get to the store? I don't care. You, you care about it. Like connect is the one which encapsulates the access to the store. We just have a simple function where we say, okay, for this component, I need two properties, do's and filter which I forgot to add here, but I'll add that later. So the, the to-dos comes here and the filter comes here, and they come from the state. So the connect creates this decorator component. It, it has to wrap the to-do list. It's pretty much the same thing we did with Flux, just with more ugly syntax, in my opinion. And the way it does this is this connect is, uh, is gets the store from the context, like hidden from you, you don't care about it, and it binds to every component, every state change. So every time the state changes, this function is executed and the states are compared. If this is different than the way it was before, it's rendered. In this way, we actually don't need to render our whole page when the state changes. It, we only need to change the stuff which care about to do some filter. In this case, it's our whole app. But in some situations, we'll care only about the filter, and the connect will protect us about it. Um, I have a technical question real quick. Uh, you're getting the to-dos from your properties, yep. but not your state. Yes. So, because the, these properties are not defined anywhere within the defaults. Is this, this is normal behavior. This yeah, the problem. way, so the idea here is, you, you need those two props. Those two props come from this decorated component. The decorated component gets the stuff which is returned from here and passes it as props to the its parent. Yeah, but that's props, not state. It's from the yes, as a props. And there is a very good reason why it's uh, state. And I'll tell you in a minute. After the commercial. Thank you. So yeah, you decorate the component. And yeah, so a very reasonable question. Why the props are better than having state? And that's another thing. Let's write some tests. <laughs> How we are going to test this component if it has state? Like, state is private for any component. If we have the state, it's private. We can change it, except <laughs> if we don't expose some weird stuff. And we can test it. <laughs> and all those components which have state are very hard to test. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't like. It's my morning, it, it's my Saturday jogging actually. <laughs> so, yeah. so let's see how I'm going to test this component. Like the decorated part is a little bit weirder to test. I'm actually want to test this component and I'm going to test it by exporting this component separately. So by default, I'm exporting the, comp the component decorated by Redux. By not default, I'm, I'm exporting this component separately. So I just can pass props and assert on the value. So by using chai and zoom and chai and zoom checkers, this is some libraries, I'm importing my to-do list and my to-do item. I'm, I'm describing my to-do list. So what my to-do list have to do? It has to do two things. It has to render a list of to-dos. So I make a fake to-do, which can be just a function returning a random object. I, I do a shadow, a shallow rendering. The idea of shallow rendering is a very nice and zoom feature where uh, the only thing it will render is this. It won't render to do item in children. So you actually don't care about what to do item contains and you don't need to stub it, pass it or whatever. You just need to provide a to do item. And this test is quite simple. I get an element, I render a to-do list where I pass those one to-do and I use O filter which is just renders everything and I check <coughs> if I have a to-do item in my element. It's quite simple. And if I want to check if the filtering is working, I can just check it way like this. I have a non-filter which doesn't render anything 
and they don't get any elements. It's a very easy way to test that. And with this test, I'm assuring my component works. It's something you read in like five minutes, even less, if you have autocomplete, which I don't. And yeah, it's a pretty nice way, but that's the simple part. Like even like with Flux, you can say, okay, the list was bad. Let's see the to-do item. The to-do item uh, gets, needs a dispatch function. This is, remember before we had a global dispatch function? This type, the react connect function, like our decorator, passes as a property a dispatch function. And we are just dispatching actions from here. We are just say, telling, okay, when we remove stuff, you just dispatch a remove to do action. And remove to do action just returns this kind of action which is just a simple object. And I mean, I don't have time in this presentation to tell you, but imagine testing this object. The only thing you need to test here is very simple. You, need to t you, ne you can pass any dispatch function you need and you can just assert it, accept this action. You don't need to set up a uh, Redux, you don't need to do anything else. You're just testing two actions. And it's quite simple. I mean, this component doesn't know anything about the other world. It doesn't care about it. The actions are just some descript descriptions of events. I mean, our system works pretty nice. I mean, this is how uh, a very good Redux system works, except kicking here. And yeah, that's like pretty much what Redux is. It's a very bare bone stuff, but being a bare bone gives you a lot of like flexibility to fix some of the Redux problems. One of the Redux problems is if you see here, I, every component which uses data has to pass this data. And what happens if I need to rename my to-do ski to not be to-do, but to be to-do list, because we have a new naming convention. And that can be helped with this selectors library, where you actually define something called selector, and you use it all the places in your app, and then you just rename this selector. There is this plugin for async work, which is Redux Tunk, which help you work with the sync stuff, like loading stuff from the server, updating your ring that way. There is a router, which is Redux router. There is an experimental library. Please, somebody use it. I, I, need, more, uh, I need to see if, if it works. <laughs> it's not mine, but I'm waiting for the authors to finish it. It's for data paging. It's uh, very similar to Relay. It's, uh, you describe what data you need from the server in your components and it store everything in Redux. And yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, uh, my slides are available at that web address, as I said. All the code is available here. <laughs> yep, thank you. I, don't, I think we have time for questions. <laughs> instead of RGS, in a few bullet points. Uh, RGS uh, has the same, pretty much the same issues with the Flux, which Flux has. The only thing which RGS has better than the native Flux stuff is less boilerplate. But it still has like the problems with the stores, communication between the stores, and it has this async ability built in. Like Redux, the dispatch function doesn't do a sync event handling. It just executes the, the, the event right now. And all the other libraries pretend to be more like event binding stuff. Okay. Some question about for the graph here. Uh, would, you, would you compare both? Uh, what? Yeah, the same question, but uh, Redux comparing with the graph here, which is supposed to actually replace the Redux. Uh, so, re GraphQL is not going to replace Redux, it's going to work together, like with this library. Uh, relate. The way Relate works is it uses, so for anybody who don't know, GraphQL is a Facebook uh, standard for an uh, alternative to REST. The idea of, of uh, GraphQL is you define a query which is a JSON template and the server fills the blanks. For example, I want a user with name, ID, and all his friends. And the server fills up the blanks. So you can actually, the, the, the view can, can, 
can say what data it needs and not the REST server knowing what data is needed. And that's the server part. And the way Redux works with GraphQL is, for the best solution I have seen is the relate stuff. The relate, you are saying, okay, my component needs, needs this data. And it uses Redux in the background to, to, to get the data, fetch it, normalize it, and store it. Pretty much what relate do, but a lot more cleaner in some ways and easier to debug, in my opinion. Anybody else? Do you see any hands up? I have a question. Okay. You know, uh, about a year and a half years, React was really the fruit of the month, and now it's like a, a standard. And we have Redux now, which is like the, the next best thing. Uh, but Angular 2 is coming, so. How, how do you feel, like in six months, and the so end, the will, where, where will Redux stay? So first, uh, the nice thing about Redux is actually, I, I know two people who are using Angular 2 in, for production work, and they both use Redux for their architecture. Since uh, it's very easy to integrate with Angular 2, the whole Redux stuff. So Angular and Redux are kind of friends. Is this going to be the last thing? Is this going to be B of C O? Most probably not. But for now, in my opinion, it's the best situation. For Angular 2, I don't know. I don't until it's ready and it's running for like six months, I don't want I don't have time for it. <laughs> okay, so asking me well, asking you for the last time. Any any more questions? Alright, I think we can close the session. Thank you very much.